Hi, I'm David Bush, Executive Director for Preservation Houston. Thank you for being with us for Building Space City, our panel discussion on 1970s architecture in the Houston area. If you are a member of Preservation Houston, thank you for your support. Free access to our programs is one of the benefits of your membership. If you're not a member, I invite you to join online at preservationhouston.org slash join. I'm also happy to welcome the members of our program partners, Docomomo US and Houston Mod. Tonight's program is part of the Bart Truxillo program series named in memory of the Preservation Houston co-founder and pioneer preservationist and supported by donations from our members and friends. If you'd like to help fund online and in-person programming or make a donation in memory of BART, please visit preservationhouston.org donate. Preservation Houston is supported in part by a grant from the City of Houston through Houston Arts Alliance and by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities through Humanities Texas. Now Preservation Houston Programs Director Jim Parsons will introduce tonight's panel. Well, thank you, David, and thanks to everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, we have people who are tuning in from all over the country, and we are very happy to have all of you with us as we talk about an important period in architecture in Houston and beyond. I want to say a big thank you to tonight's presenting partners, Houston Mod and Docomomo US. Houston Mod works to promote knowledge and appreciation of modern architecture and design in Houston. And Docomomo US is dedicated to the documentation and conservation of modern buildings, sites, and neighborhoods across the country. If you aren't familiar with these organizations, be sure to look them up. You can learn more about Houston Mod at HoustonMod.org and Docomomo US at Docomomo-US.org. Houston Mod and Preservation Houston are both affiliated with Docomomo US. Uh, Houston Mod is an official friend organization of DOCO, and Preservation Houston is an organizational member. We appreciate the work that both of these groups do and the collaboration and the friendships that we enjoy by being connected with them. Also, I wanna say a quick word about the title image here. Um, it's a 1978 Houston Post photo illustration of what they thought the Houston skyline was going to look like in the year 2000. And if it doesn't look quite right from a modern perspective, uh, they did miss some things and you'll hear a bit more about that later tonight, but it's just kind of a fun way to see what they thought uh, the, the city of the future was going to be like. Now we're lucky to have some fantastic speakers who are going to take us back to the 70s this evening. Anna Maud is an author, architectural historian, and director of tax credits with Ryan. Carrie Gelzer is the founding principal of Carrie Gelzer Associates, an architecture and urban planning firm. Michael Kubo is an author, assistant professor, and program coordinator for architectural history and theory at the University of Houston's Gerald D. Hines College of Architecture and Design. And Liz Waitakis is the executive director of Docomomo US. Liz is joining us tonight from New York, and she's gonna kick things off by putting 70s design in context and talking about some of the advocacy and preservation work that is taking place nationwide. So Liz, thank you for being here, and uh, I will leave things with you, take it away. Just wait for we uh, get the slides up, great. So. Um... It's, it's really great uh, to be with all of you tonight and our friends in Houston and around the country. Docomoma US appreciates Preservation Houston's efforts to take a deeper dive into how the 1970s shaped Houston as we continue to focus nationally on projects of this period as they reach the 50 year and national register mark. As you know, the 1970s was a time of great change and even greater variety of forms technical advances and new ideas of architectural thinking. For all the fragmentation and contradictions, architectural designs of the 1970s had many powerful external forces to take into consideration, including the recently passed National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, an act that perhaps unconsciously led to the desire to build more original and monumental forms over similar applied ideas. Architectural designs also were responding to the cultural zeitgeist, political and social upheaval, and the looming energy crisis. New advances in material and building technology, and they sought to elevate values much like earlier designs. Next. Yay. <laughs> so when we talk about the 1970s, personally, it was one of my favorite decades because it was the decade that I was born. 
So here, that's me on the left-hand side, roller skating at one of my favorite sites from the 70s, the Empire State Plaza, or what the locals call the mall in Albany, New York. This was Wallace Harrison and Governor Nelson Rockefeller's attempt at Brasilia on the Hudson and completed in 1976. The mall and myself, I know it's hard to believe, are generally the same age, so I'm sensitive about the preservation of all things from that decade. Next. Um, so it, it should be noted that apparently I was getting into trouble at a very early age. Uh, I, I think I always told myself that those no roller skating signs were something new that was on the mall and my mom would never let me roller skate uh, there. When there were signs, clearly this is an original sign uh, that says uh, no, uh, that skating is only allowed in the road areas and not the actual plaza. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so really just getting into, you know, what makes, uh, you know, architecture from the 70s um, uh, so interesting is, um, and complex is its monumentality. After year, years of urban renewal and slum clearance, many cities finally realized large scale plans. Municipal and corporate projects were completed across the country, including pictured here, the Boston Government Services Center by Paul Rudolph from 1971. Also Dallas City Hall by I.M. Pei from 1978, the Bonaventure Hotel in Los Angeles, John Portman, 1976, to name a few. Many of these projects used eminent domain to take land and were extremely disruptive in their communities. Today we wrestle with not only how to preserve, but if we should preserve them and their impact on the climate and the communities that remember what they replaced. Docomoma US continues to participate with a coalition of advocates for the Boston Government Center, which the state of Massachusetts would like to partially demolish. Next. Architecture of the 1970s was also, for better or worse, experimental in form and materiality. Social and financial struggles brought a wealth of creativity and experimentation. This often can be seen in smaller or more personal projects such as the Steel House in Lubbock, Texas by Robert Bruno from 1974 and continuing and the Frank Gehry House in Santa Monica, 1978. I think Frank stopped tinkering with it. I think he's old enough now, he can let it go. Uh, so while Docomoma US has not been brought in to advocate for these smaller homes, the recent demolition of Marcel Breuer's Geller House on Long Island makes these intimate works even more challenging to preserve. Next. Experimentation was also taking place in large scale projects with new building types of uh, building skin and materials. Projects like the recently landmarked Federal Aviation Administration's West Coast Headquarters designed by Cesar Pelli and Anthony Lumsdum of Dim Jim and the Pacific Design Center also by Cesar Pelli highlight the relationship of new materials to the industries in which they were designed for. While the Pacific Design Center is somewhat still in use, it was largely abandoned when I visited in 2019 and the FAA building uh, was auctioned that same year for a fairly large sum. Next. Back here in New York in 2016, Docomoma US led the efforts to preserve the interiors of the UN Plaza Hotel and the Ambassador Grill by Kevin Rose, John Dingaloo and Associates. 40 years after they opened, the interiors were still incredible with this dazzling mirror and Mylar fake skylight. Yes, this is in a basement and meant to feel open and airy with the use of um, this just gorgeous skylight. Um, but to the hotel industry, this design in 2016 was nothing more than dated. When it was built, the New York Times called these spaces the most sensuous piece of modern design in a public place in New York since the Four Seasons was finished in 1958. While it took a considerable amount of work, Docomoma US was successful in designating these rooms as an interior landmark. And I highly recommend if you come to New York to stay in the UN Plaza Hotel um, and be able to um, sit downstairs. I will come and have a drink with you. It's just really such a fantastic space. Next. 
Dokomomi US and our peers across the country have led the conversation on 70s architecture and all the baggage that comes with that. We have fought to preserve the aforementioned projects, which are all still standing. Burroughs Welcome, pictured here by Paul Rudolph in North Carolina, is, however, one exception that was demolished in 2020. Advocating for historic structures, including sites from the 70s, start with understanding and advocacy at home. The work of Jokomomo and preserving significant modern sites cannot be realized without local advocates who know and love these projects. Preserving sites from the 70s is extremely challenging with a minimal amount of in-depth research and understanding. Throw in materials that are hazardous or can no longer be sourced, projects that displace whole communities, it can be extremely challenging to gather support, which makes being here today virtually in Houston exciting to be able to spread the word that architecture of the 70s deserves our attention and preservation. So that's my introduction. And now uh, I would like to kick it over to Michael Kubo. Michael. Thanks, uh, Liz. I'm, I'm al I always love seeing images of every single one of those projects. Um, and I think that it's a nice lead into the, the projects that I'll be talking about uh, today, which is to Houston Center. Uh, and it's great to see so many people uh, who are also interested in this time period as much as we are. Uh, we are. So I think that the value of uh, certain places, you know, in our cities uh, and of certain architectural sites is not just about the building or the site itself. It's also about uh, the histories that that site allows us to situate ourselves in, resituate ourselves in. And in many cases, it's about not just what is there, what has been built, but about a place that provides the key in some sense to things that were not built, to uh, often ambitious uh, kind of radical visions for places that may have been projected but never uh, or only partially realized. And then what is there, uh, it becomes the, the lens through which we can access those kind of unrealized visions. Uh, and to Houston Center, uh, William Pereira and Associates, uh, sort of 1974 as part of a much bigger project is, is one of those sites for, for me. Uh, next slide, please. So the period that we're looking at uh, in the 1970s, of course, is associated economically, uh, culturally in the US with the spike uh, in uh, crude oil prices. Globally, uh, especially around uh, 1973, the beginning of the OPEC oil embargo uh, and the spike lasted for about a decade. Uh, and this is, as Liz mentioned, also a period that's associated with uh, growing environmental consciousness and a growing uh, sort of sense of the looming energy crisis and the need to confront that. Uh, at large. Next slide, uh, please. So uh, this period, if this period was associated commonly with recession, with stagnation, with crisis, uh, with economic decline, you know, in very many places uh, around the world, uh, especially most of the US uh, and in Europe, as you see in these kinds of images of gas lines, gas shortages, etc., uh, economic suffering. Uh, next slide. In Houston, the situation was, of course, the opposite uh, because Houston was so tied to the oil and gas industry. So when oil prices were high, you know, Houston was booming while uh, many other places were suffering. So if you, as, so this was significantly the period when the downtown uh, expanded and and when lots of the towers that are uh, that are there today were built. And so you can see that the timeline of a lot of these, and this included the Houston Center project. Uh, I also want to note in this image. While we're on it, that at the bottom, uh, the landscape you see is Tranquility Park, which Carrie will talk about. Uh, so just to keep that in mind for later. Next slide, please. And this was, of course, the time period, you know, out of this boom that Houston sought to project itself uh, onto the world stage. There was a competition at the end of this kind of period in 1982 uh, to design the world's, what would have been the world's tallest tower, to kind of snatch the title of world's tallest tower from Chicago and New York that had been competing you know, for the better part of the century uh, or 50 plus years over this uh, title. Uh, this is uh, Jan Murphy wins, wins the competition for this tower, uh, which was never built. Next slide. And it's the same period when uh, many of these towers, uh, particularly this one, Pennzoil Place, came to figure globally uh, far beyond Houston in discussions about what was happening to 
architecture, what was happening to modernism uh, stylistically, aesthetically, formally, and the ways that these buildings, uh, Penzoil Place in particular, represented certain shifts uh, in, in into what was called late modern architecture. That was how it was branded by Charles Jenks and Pennzoil Place becomes not just an emblem of the oil and gas industry uh, everywhere at large and what kind of aesthetics that can produce, but also uh, what those uh, kinds of things might mean stylistically for changes in the, the form and aesthetics of towers at large. Uh, next image. Uh, so the the Houston Center project uh, to Houston Center is, is, of course, just a piece of this much bigger 32 block uh, development that I think of as, you know, the most emblematic of all of the ambitions for Houston's downtown uh, within this history in this period. Uh, this would have radically reshaped and extended the downtown. It would have been like a whole second uh, downtown. Uh, kind of at a T to the existing downtown. It would have been, it was conceived of as a city within a city uh, at a time when, as you can see from these images, a lot of the downtown, especially the Eastern East downtown was fallow, was not particularly coveted as a place to be, was associated with uh, crime, was seen as dangerous in a lot of ways, uh, was not a kind of happening place. And these developers thought that this would revitalize interest, revitalize the downtown as the center of this sort of globally uh, booming, thriving uh, metropolis. Next slide, please. Uh, this was what it would have looked like according to the rendering. So it would have been a massive, massive development with uh, office towers, uh, hotels, residential buildings, a huge glass enclosed uh, shopping mall at its center. Uh, retail, entertainment, all built on top of a continuous four-story plinth of functions that would have included parking and roadways and all sorts of other things uh, that would have spanned over the existing street grid and would have extended really across this whole 32-block radius. So it's, it's really the, the kind of peak 70s megastructure uh, as it would have been applied to Houston. Next slide. Uh, this is how it was advertised, of course, a city of tomorrow, right? And you can see these kind of heroic renderings. This continuous ground level. Um, I, so this is October 1970. Speaking of the return of the past, I will. Uh, we won't talk about the other headline here that you see on the left, Russian-U.S. relations at a two-year low, but you can sort of note that one. Uh, next slide, please. So again, this is just to show you some images of how spectacular this was imagined to be. And just imagine what this would have been if it had been built sort of at large, this continuous base with multi-level roadways and this sort of enclosure. It would have had a monorail, a monorail that would have linked all the buildings, kind of run continuously around it and also stitched it into the downtown, populated sort of at, on its top by this kind of landscape. Uh, it was meant to be really an, a kind of universe unto itself uh, in which conceivably you could be there and in a way not have to engage with the rest of the downtown. Uh, this probably could never have been built at the scale and scope that it was imagined in these, you know, fairly futuristic kind of sci-fi uh, renderings. Next slide. So of course we all know the back end of the story. What happened uh, is that the money ran out, right? The, the uh, as you saw from the graph in crude oil prices, prices collapsed. And then, you know, Houston was left sort of at the end of the boom uh, with what could have been as it was, uh, it played out in the newspapers, all of these things that were projected, the tallest tower, Houston center that were never built, uh, and then sort of suffered from the bust uh, in oil prices. Next slide. Uh, and that's what, what happened to Houston Center. So Houston Center only was only, you know, the, what you see at two Houston Center, this one tower site is a tiny, tiny, tiny fragment really at the corner, the, the corner that's closest to the existing downtown uh, and would have extended from there. And so it's only a piece, it's a piece of a piece of a fragment of this larger plan. Uh, next slide. And that's, I think, you know, whenever I look at an image like this, this is a photograph by Wayne Tom on the right. It's, I can almost imagine, you know, I see in my mind the, the rendering of what was supposed to have extended, you know, onto all of those blocks at a time when there was really nothing, you know, there was very little there. There was no uh, convention center, you know, there was no Discovery Green, there was, you know, nothing had, had sort of happened in that uh, space. Next slide. Um, formally and aesthetically, I also think to Houston Center is important 
as really the emblem, uh, the emblematic project in Houston of a series of currents that were happening architecturally in uh, other places in the US. And particularly this group of architects uh, that came to be known as the LA Silvers in the 1970s, uh, who were really pioneering. This was a group that included Cesar Pelli, uh, Tony Lagoon, we've seen images of from Liz, uh, Tony Lumsden, uh, firms like Dim Jim, uh, the Pacific Design Center, which you see in these images in which Liz also showed, or the FAA building that she also showed. Uh, the LA Silvers were uh, associated with innovations in architectural techniques of things like curtain walls, uh, use of mirror glass and of these really slick kind of futuristic, almost high-tech uh, architectural languages. Uh, next slide. And the LA Silvers included as one of their members, Frank Dimster, who was the project architect within Pereira's office for Houston Center. So you see in these publications in architectural magazines of the LA Silvers as, you know, kind of these trendsetters in architecture, you see Dimster and two Houston Center as an emblematic project included among them. And absolutely uh, in the photo, you can see that Houston Center really did fulfill this kind of slick, high-tech kind of space agey futuristic aesthetic of kind of shimmering uh, metal, shiny metal with glass in a kind of hermetically sealed, uh, kind of highly technical skin. Uh, next slide. And this was at the same time, again, that, that architectural theorists and critics and journalists and other people were were trying to understand uh, what these aesthetics really meant. And they were writing, like Charles Jenks in his book on late modern architecture, were writing a lot about uh, the, the sort of innovations and development of what Jenks called, you know, the slick skin or these optical effects of these kind of hermetic and closed skin volumes. And so two Houston Center as a building was right at the center of all of these currents. Uh, next slide. So just to show you, uh, wrap up with a few photos of uh, how you would have kind of accessed this and how it relates to this broader vision for this unbuilt uh, four-story plinth. Uh, here are some, I'm gonna show you some photos uh, from all from Wayne Tom, who's one of the major photographers of late modern uh, architecture in LA. And uh, period, uh, who took these amazing photos of Houston Center. You would have at the time ascended you know, into the body of the building through this pretty spectacular elevator sequence, uh, kind of you know, flying up and over you know, the, the ground level uh, through this kind of glass enclosure where you, through which you can see the tower above. And again, remember, this was all meant to be attached to these this continuous megastructure of these lower four stories in which it would have made sense as something that would have connected you into all of it rather than just as a kind of one-off. Uh, next slide. This sequence was spectacular enough or at least futuristic enough that it was uh, included in the film Future World, for example, the sequel to Westworld, uh, the lesser known sequel to Westworld in 1976, uh, starring Peter Fonda. Uh, this, this sequence you know, became this, the setting for you know, a scene in the movie among others uh, where they, you know, there's a kind of chat where they, they uh, descend the escalator uh, and kind of play out this sort of sequence. Uh, next slide. These escalators, you would have turned the corner, would have gotten you up to uh, what still exists, this dramatic atrium uh, right at the center of the building, which you can see in one of the original plans, uh, was built slightly differently. But this uh, atrium space would have been right where the monorail would have gone all the way through. So you can see that there are kind of fragments even within the body of the building that kind of key you into where there are some pieces that you can read out as being connected to this larger, much more radical vision, uh, including the monorail that was never realized. Uh, next slide. And then finally, that would have you would have walked out of that atrium into this uh, this sort of grand public space that is you're now above street level. You're on top of this plinth. You are five floors up. Uh, it kind of floating out over the street with these X braces structurally that you can see where the entire building is spanning over the street level that, that now uh, runs underneath it. Uh, and this again would have been just one of a series of parks and landscapes that would have continuously covered the surface of this four-story megastructure. Uh, next slide. And so just to, to finish, uh, I should talk a little bit about what's happened today. Uh, the part of the, this escalator sequence in particular at ground level has been demolished. A lot of these spaces, including that landscape above that I showed you, they're all gone now. 
uh, they've become subsumed in what I would say is, you know, pretty standard sort of glass enclosure retail development that that kind of ignores, I think, the history of this site as a fragment of this much bigger piece of kind of unrealized 70s visions and, you know, tries to make it more, let's say, commercially successful in a pretty standard way. Um, you know, I'm not a fan of this kind of thing because for me, this is to forget the history that I uh, really try to see out of this building. Uh, next slide. And so that's why this side of the building, the other side of the building for me is still the preferred one, even though, you know, foreboding as it might be. Uh, I like to start whenever I go there with this corner, uh, because this really is the corner of the site, which is the corner of the bigger Houston center development. And so you can almost see literally, you know, the, the corner, not the corner stone, but the corner pier or the corner column or the corner cylinder from which all of it uh, I can reconstruct in my, in my mind if I look at it, you know, somewhat closely. Uh, all right, thanks. And now I will turn it over to Carrie on that note. Thank you, Michael. And um, I'll be talking about Tranquility Park. As Michael mentioned, it's on the other side of downtown from where to Houston Center is. Next. Here's a little background about it. Tranquility Park is located in downtown Houston Civic Center complex. It's immediately north of City Hall. The park was created following an historic worldwide event the first moon landing on July 20th, 1969. The world heard the words, Houston, tranquility base here, the eagle has landed. Apollo 11 had just touched down on the moon on a large dark plane known as the Sea of Tranquility. That event and those words provided the impetus for creation of the park. Within a month, Houston City Council voted to celebrate the first moon landing by establishing a new public park, Tranquility Park. The design was to quote, embodies some symbolic expression of the landing of Apollo 11 on the moon, end quote. Two unattractive surface parking lots adjacent to City Hall, plus the street between them would become the park site. New underground parking was to be provided below the park equal to or greater than the number of, <clears throat> excuse me, removed surface spaces. The design and construction was a very slow process spanning nearly the entire decade of the 1970s. Tranquility Park was officially dedicated on July 20th, 1979, on the 10th anniversary of the moon landing. This is probably my favorite image of Tranquility Park. Uh, the central fountain and its towers are glowing at dusk with water washing down the towers, cascading to the water basins below against a backdrop of the Houston even, evening skyline. Next slide. Here's a similar view, but the daytime version of it. And next. Turning around and with the skyline to your back behind us, the site slopes down towards the bayou beyond uh, at the upper right. The layout of the path along this natural slope provides a strong diagonal connection with the southeast to north, from the southeast to the northwest corner of the site. Next. And this is a perpendicular view looking back uh, from at the fountain and the fountain towers. Next. This is an aerial view to sort of help with the orientation. You can see the diagonal walk from the lower left up to the upper right, and the bayou is up to the right. The city skyline is to your lower left. The fountain, you can see the waterway and the fountain towers in the center of the long green span or blue green span. There are two round circles. Um, one, at the, one on the left has a little green tinge to it. And I'll talk about those a little bit later on. The blue awnings kind of in the middle on the side uh, covers the garage entrance to the underground parking. Next. I mentioned that Tranquility Park was part of the Civic Center complex. This is the Civic Center plan prepared in the 1920s by Hare and Hare. Next. And this is what tra has transpired since then. So at the top is Sam Houston Park, which has been there all along. It's our first city park. On the left is the Julie Addison Library Building, which was built around the time in the 20s or when this plan was developed. In the center where the two, the double block put together is now our City Hall and, and Herman Square with the reflecting basin. And the two lower right from that is Tranquility Park. It's on two blocks that at one time was thought to be, would have been other buildings for the, for the Civic Center. Next. 
here's an aerial view of that same area, um, sort of peeking over the shoulder of the Esperson building in the 1920s and the future side of Tranquility Park on the, on the two blocks on the right. Next. Today, here's the aerial view. The big green swath on the upper left is Sam Houston Park. Right in the center is City Hall with it, the blue reflecting basin uh, down below it. And then to the lower right is that slight curve of the fountain and water at Tranquility Park, leading from the city skyline up to the bayou underneath the freeways on the upper right. Next. Each of these areas have a little bit a, a, their own treatment of public space and what they're in. Sam Houston Park is has a collection of historic buildings that have been moved into the site. Next. The Julie Addison Library was designed in the 1920s, and it's the one that fits with what was imagined for the whole complex at the time, and ended up being the only building that was designed within that uh, style. Next. By the time city, we, Houston was ready to build City Hall, it was the 1930s, and the new way of designing buildings was in Art Deco style. The City Hall opened in 1939. It has the reflecting pool, pool in front. And what's nice to know is that the postcard image on the left, which is um, an early sketch of what the pool was to look like, it looks remarkably like that today. So Houston has managed to keep, keep the view of the, uh, the, the, the basin in front as it was before. Next. Um, this is Tranquility Park. The aerial view on the right shows the view of the park coupled with a sketch from the architect, uh, Charles Tapley. Charles Tapley associates were selected for the park. Charles Tapley was both an architect and landscape architect, known for his modern design aesthetic and passion for our bayous. There were many challenges to the park, which he integrated into the design. The engineers were already underway on the underground garage. He worked on the placement of trees, locating them around the perimeter to avoid conflict with the garage. Ventilation stacks for the garage became towers treated as sculpture. Underground parking entry was screened from the park with an elevated platform oriented to the park. Grassy seating areas are interwoven with narrow sloping walkways for strollers and wheelchairs to traverse the sloping site. Next. The tower ventilation stacks are meant to recall the rockets from the spacecraft. Next and they flank the walk, the pathway on your way to diagonally across the park. Next. They also are really lovely sculpture um, with the city hall back on the back side on the left. And then on the right are other ventilation stacks that are not out of the middle, but um, are along the perimeter of the park in keeping with this, the, the cylindrical aspects of the park. Next. The trees um, along the perimeter are on sloping grade. The adjacent sidewalk was slightly elevated enough to help give some slope down to the street level to actually allow some root to grow for the trees above the parking garage. Next. There's a strong diagonal emphasis in the park going from the southeast corner to the northwest corner. On the left is the direction heading towards, towards the northeast, northwest to the bayou. And when you turn around, on the other side is a strong diagonal thrust back to the Houston downtown skyline. And that's a real key factor in how the park, how you, as you walk through it, that you feel. Next. They're gently sloping grassy berms with paved pathways for strollers. Next. And bikes. Next. And photo shoots. Next. The entrance to the parking garage was concealed with a wide platform. Next. And that on the, on the park side, the platform helps screen the cars. And you have no sense of having a busy street on this side of the park at all. Next. The view on top of the platform is pretty amazing. Uh, it's a, a function, it can function as a mini stage. It has a long view, uh, Vista looking south. City Hall is on the right. Next. And that's and from City Hall, the view extends down in between the two library buildings all the way down to Allen Center. So Tapley 
made sure to capture that elongated view crosswise um, across the civic center complex. Next. The platform can also, is, also works as a place to ha have a crowd attend and speakers speak. This is from March for Our Lives in 2018. Next. And the park can be filled up. It can be packed. Next. Tranquility Park was designed when urban landscape designers were exploring the use of exposed concrete in different textures, stair stepping, and water flowing over concrete edges. This is Seattle's Freeway Park, uh, designed by Halperin and Associates, designed to help cover up a new freeway that went in. It opened in July 4th, 1976. Next, another view of that park. And next, another park designed at this time, and I noticed it was in Liz's first slide, is the Minneapolis uh, Park of PV Park, designed by Paul Freeberg. It opened in 1975. Here, the concrete is warmer and closer to the color of Tranquility Park, and it too has cascading water and stepping pads. Next. And another image of that park. Next. There are several little gems and tributes to the moon landing standard throughout the park. Um, these, the black panels are the dedication panels. It took several city council uh, and, and mayors to be able to complete the park, so they're all listed. The silver panel, if you go to the next slide, is actually an etching and it's on the left. And the etching was by, is by Naomi Savage. And it's of the first photo of a human standing on the moon. It's really lovely if you can go up and look at it. On the right um, is a bronze medallion. There are bronze medallions in the pavers at each of the four corners to the park. And they're in, engraved with the quote, Houston Tranquility Base here, the eagle has landed. And, translated into 15 languages. Next. I mentioned the two round circles in looking at the aerial view of the plan. Um, they are low mounds. The intent was to recall the shallow craters of the lunar landscape. This, uh, this one provides ac access to the parking garage. Next. Um, the larger mound is actually, uh, is this one which has sloped uh, grass sides, but it's actually open on the inside. If you go uh, next slide. And on the inside wall, the line that you see on that wall, it's not in good condition, but the line is there. It's to represent the arc of the flight of the Apollo 11. And on the left is a cast of Neil Armstrong's boot, uh, boot print on the moon. And it's there for you to go up and place your foot down on top of it to imagine you're stepping on the moon. Next. The park is better when the towers are lit and the water's cascading, um, but it's still strong, uh, a strong structural element as it is. Next. Uh, it's also better in, when the pools are full and people can engage with the water. Next. Although it's at its, it's at its best, the park remains as it was conceived, reflecting the spirit of exploration and tribute to the audacity of the moon, flat, moon landing. Next. And it continues to be a striking foreground to the Houston skyline. Next, as it was when it was, dead. And, and next slide two. And this is the view as when it was dedicated in 1979. So I find that the, the view looking back at the skyline succeeds now even as it did in when it was first dedicated. So that's the end for me, and uh, Anamad is next. So good evening, everyone. And I'm going to talk to you about the American National Insurance Company in Galveston, Texas, known by its acronym ANACO. Next slide. So the, the history of this company, ANACO, is very intricately intertwined with the history of Galveston, the Moody family of Galveston, and the American insurance industry. The company was founded in 1905 in Galveston. And by the time this building opened in 1971, this as its national headquarters, the sort of direction that the company gave the architects was 
we fully intend for the public to have full view of our company. So nothing, you know, gives a statement better than a, a city of very lower mid-rise buildings when you compare it to this, a 20-story, the only skyscraper in town. Next slide. So the building makes a statement. It made a statement when it was built. It continues to make a statement. By the 1960s, uh, the company had expanded nationwide into Canada and Europe. So the architects, Newhouse and Taylor, the architecture firm from Houston, were charged with designing a new corporate headquarters to convey this evolved corporate identity and bring its local employees all under one roof. The building was to convey strength, prestige, and legitimacy. Uh, design influences you can see uh, similarities with Lieber House in New York, Seagram's in New York, as well as probably more literally Paul Rudolph's Blue Cross Blue Shield building in Boston. Stylistically, it's a new formalist building, and I would add a monumental new formalist building or a new formalist building on steroids. And this, I love this photo because it's a great comparison. Uh, new formalism really is an adaptation or really a continuation of the three part composition where you have a clear base of the building with Anaco, this monumental colonnade, the center section or the shaft, and then the cornice. So when you compare it with the building and the two buildings in front, you see these very clear three parts with these elaborate cornices and really a lot of terracotta projections. Anico has pared that down, simplified and abstracted um, the, that or lack of ornamentation. The facades are mirror images of each other. It's a regular fenestration, repetitive, um, pure geometric forms. Next slide. So when we were practicing for this session, I made the comment that this building, when I went under this colonnade for the first time, I felt very small and I felt like I was in a de Chirico painting. And I thought, well, that's, you know, nobody needs to know that. That's just kind of a silly analogy. And Michael Kubo suggested, oh no, you gotta, you gotta talk about that. It's important. And so it's true, this de Chirico was, um, a surrealist, um, Italian surrealist. He actually died in the 70s, but the paintings that we're most familiar with his work are from the early 1900s, this one from 1914. And this was one of the first paintings I ever saw of his. And it's kind of these weird vanishing points, these very foreboding dominant buildings. And then this small uh, figure, this uh, child with her hoop. And um, that's how I felt under this colonnade, the colonnade of Anico on the left. And then um, you can also see the similarities, you know, what is going on also in Italy. This is an Aldo Rossi, Rossi building um, in the, the San Cataldo Cemetery in Modena. And um, I love Ada Louise Huxtable's um, quote that she called um, Rossi a poet that happened to be an architect. So sometimes these paring down of the ornamentation and reducing these buildings to their simple forms as we see happening in the 70s, it can be hard for us to access. But if you look hard enough, there is a lot of beauty in that rigor and in that simplicity. Next slide. So back to Galveston and our building. Uh, Galveston is a 19th century city, 50 miles down the road on the Gulf of Mexico. It was planned with a very regular grid. And the, the photo on the right is a photo from the 20th floor of Anaco looking towards the Gulf of Mexico. So you can just see the regular grid street case Red, regular gridded streetscape and the residential area as you look towards the beach. 
Next slide. So before there was Anico, there was a viable 19th century commercial district, the central business district. And these three Sanborn maps show the evolution uh, from more smaller scale to larger scale commercial from the 1890s through the, 19, the late 1940s. Next slide. And part of, uh, Liz alluded to this with the slide of the Boston City Hall. These buildings, did destroy this commercial area. And here are some aerials on the left from 1954 when this block was still intact. And then 69 when the whole block was leveled to prepare for Anaco. Next slide. So these buildings, because they go up, they, and have house a lot of people, they have a voracious appetite for parking. And so for this building, there is parking underground, there is a parking lot to the next block to the left, the next block to the southwest, the block to the south, and even to the southeast. So not only was this block decimated, but the surrounding blocks also to serve the cars that the people brought to the building. So um, I heard the word disruptive used by one of our uh, previous panelists. And um, that's evidence here. We have this very formal grid of the city of Galveston, but Anico is gonna rotate their um, building 45 degrees. So each of the facades of the building actually face the street corners. Um, next slide. So when this building was uh, newly opened, there was an article in the Texas Star and it said, um, if you want a 20 story building on Galveston Island, an island that's only six feet above sea level, where the soil is soft and silty, you have problems. If you want to add a basement, the low grade parking garage, you've got more problems. But that's what Anico wanted. So again, we can go to the moon, we can certainly build a subterranean parking garage with a 20 story building on top on Galveston Island. And enter uh, Joe Colosco, a very well known uh, engineer uh, based, he spent most of his career in Houston. And he's very, not, he's very well known for his passion and expertise in solving these very complex skyscraper and engineering challenges. So the uh, solution here was what was called a tube in tube. And these photographs illustrate that well. You have the, the center core, which has two stairwells and the elevator towers in the, the center, the center tube, and then the exoskeletal perimeter tube. And then those are connected on each floor plate to give you the hurricane uh, wind resistant. So um, it also conveys the solidity of the building, the solidity and longevity of the corporation, its resiliency on this sand barrier island. Next slide. So the building is very minimally detailed. It's very rigorous in its alignment, its repetitive systems, both on the interior and the exterior. And for this reason, as we've studied this building, um, we had to pay more and more attention to the details. And I love this photograph on the right taken by my colleague, uh, Adam Rajpur. And you can see there's a flagpole in the center, which perfectly aligns with that corner of the building. So that is purposeful. It is designed. Um, the dominant materials on the outside are the painted concrete and glass of the windows. And then once you get to the interior 
lobby, you can see it um, on the left inset, it's inset 58. Um, that is clad in more classical materials of travertine. Next slide. So the building um, disrupts the streetscape. You can see the, the slide on the left, a 19th century building across the street. Then you've got this sort of landscape of concrete and then these steps cascading towards the sidewalk. And again, in the details, when we looked at these steps, the risers are actually concave uh, custom-made bricks. And this drawing um, was done by Carrie Gelzer um, because we had to, um, we're, we're salvaging some of these uh, risers and then we're going to have a certain amount of breakage. So we're going to um, have to have some replicated. replicated. So we had to have measured drawings to uh, um, allow for the replication. The plaza does cover the, the parking garage and basement. And so the weatherproofing like Tranquility Park, um, decades of wind and hurricanes have had their impact on the basement and the steel um, reinforcing of the concrete. So it was time for uh, major upgrades. So the plaza is being removed and then the pavers being uh, replaced. And I will add that the pavers of Tranquility Park are the same pavers used here. So it's like everyone used these kind of pavers in the 70s. Uh, next slide. Uh, moving to the interior, uh, this, um, is a 58 foot uh, space. The pavers from the exterior plaza do continue into the interior. The walls are all clad in uh, travertine, very similar design to um, Jones Hall in Houston. I've heard it say before, we haven't mentioned it in this um, talk, but the the skyscraper could be alluded to as the cathedral of capitalism from the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, next slide. Uh, the rigor of the, these systems and their design continues on the interior. And at what we found uh, preparing the National Register nomination in that research, it was a, uh, another modular system this Eastern's movable partition system from uh, 19, 1960. It had wall panels. Um, you can see the original um, on the image on the left, metal framed, solid wood doors, floor to ceiling. And um, the lighting also was a design, this regular grid. And in these two images, you can see every other light is lit. Um, and that's because we don't, with energy efficiency and trying to use less energy and um, the, the uh, lighting was put on two different switches. So depending on how much light they needed, they could um, turn one, every other light off. Rather than the 70s, you know, they're all on. We've got enough energy to, to burn. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> this is um, the a board of directors entrance, uh, sort of their reception area, and then the doors, and the image on the right into the boardroom. And you can see this uh, lighting grid on the ceiling is has all of the lights on. So the... The organization of the inner spaces, the with the tube and tube, you get this um, kind of a donut on each floor. And true to corporate structures, you know, there was an established hierarchy. The executives were on the top floor. The managers tended to have the offices against the windows around the perimeter, and then the sort of more worker bees on the interior with no access to natural light. Um, these, the building, similar to what Michael was talking about, this sort of enclosed system, you could go here um, in the day and never have to leave. There was a cafeteria, there was a clinic with the nurse. 
uh, there was a, a mail room that served the building. There was an auditorium. So you did not have to leave. You could just go to work, stay in work all the whole day. Um, next slide. <clears throat> So I'll end with some of the preservation uh, challenges is how do we um, respect the, the rigor of the design? I think on the exterior, it's a little easier. On the interior, uh, corporations are a lot more democratic now. They don't have that hierarchy. Everybody um, deserves access to natural light. So how do we maintain the donut um, and provide spaces and gaps so that natural light can be enjoyed by everyone working on the floor rather than just those managers on the outer ring of the donut? So this building was listed in the National Register of Historic Places. It's one of a small handful, but a growing number. We are working on more and more buildings from the 1970s. And um, as I mentioned, with the plaza and the deteriorating of concrete, it was really time for the owner to make a significant investment or this building was going to enter that period of, you know, it was going to probably sway in the next 10 years to where it was really um, unable, it, not cost effective to be repaired. So we're doing the work in two phases, the first being the plaza removing every, all the pavers, um, redoing the waterproofing, putting the pavers back and recladding all of the uh, travertine so that the anchoring system and clips are more hurricane resistant. Whenever there is a storm in Galveston, they do lose some panels. So try to design it so it's more resilient. And, um, you know, the changes in cafeteria rather than you know, it's a, a set menu. It, it is um, change that, you know, people can go to different stations and have a sandwich or a burrito or a ramen bowl or salad. So I will now hand it over to Steve. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, uh, Carrie, Michael, and Liz. It was uh, very interesting to see each of those presentations and to see them. Uh, together in that um, in that order. Um, while you're warmed up, Anna, I'd like to ask you: Was it um, have you encountered people who were surprised to know that uh, Anico is um, historic? Is it old enough to be historic, and is it um, that it's on the National Register might surprise people, and that you're in a restoration mode on it at the same time? Yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, I think it's part of the legacy of what Liz started with. Um, my graduate school professors loathed these buildings because they did so much destruction to commercial or residential neighborhoods. So it's, I have that history from, you know, in, from school, but then, um, these do tell stories and they do tell stories about um, Texas, about Galveston, about uh, our country uh, as we've seen. And those stories are important and it history doesn't stop, it keeps going. That's um, what I thought was interesting about Michael's selection of the uh, two Houston Center. Um, I don't know if you even briefly considered uh, an analysis of Pennzoil Place, Michael, when you first dove into this? It might have been a more obvious um, choice. Maybe some people expect it uh, to be uh, considered. I mean, it's it's the 70s icon that most people would probably uh, agree to as a, Houston, a downtown Houston landmark. Um, it's still a lot of people's favorite building and would say it's uh, the, the best of this uh, monumental, bold style and, and way of thinking about a building. So when you came in with uh, Houston Center, you know, it's, uh, as Anna said, there's, there's many lessons to be learned about, maybe about a reach exceeding grasp and uh, dealing with large scale issues uh, at an exciting time when you, when you could really do those things or at mm -hmm. least yeah. uh, attempt those things. Yeah. I mean, I absolutely, of course, you know, my, my 
my other first thought was absolutely to talk about Pennzoil Place. And, you know, I do talk about Pennzoil Place and I'm happy to talk about it, you know, anywhere, anytime at length for all the reasons that you, that you list. Um, it's, it is indeed one of my favorite buildings in Houston and indeed anywhere in, in that uh, time period. Uh, but I think, you know, for this, for purposes of this conversation, especially thinking about how the 70s shaped Houston, um, there's just a lot that I find really fascinating about to Houston Center, and especially um, the fact that it's messy in, in those terms, that it's, you know, depends on places, there are lots of ways of talking about it as, you know, it was absolutely innovative in terms of the typology of the skyscraper, it was as a real estate model, it very, it opened the door really everywhere, um, you know, around the world to um, pretty drastic kind of alterations in the form and composition of uh, towers, you know, as a way of making profit off of spectacular buildings, essentially. So like Fountain Place in Dallas and other things that, that kind of come directly out of it. Uh, but, you know, in thinking about Houston's urbanism and Houston's history coming out of that decade, there, there's a lot about Two Houston Center that I just think of as, I, I, I'm interested in both cases and the kind of mess, the messiness of reality of, the thing that's projected, but partially realized, and then how those fragments kind of stick around, and you know, what do we do with the, with the legacy of those things? And so, I, I think maybe I, you know, I, I felt like Houston Center maybe should get a little bit of love or attention, kind of in this setting, in a way that you know, um, a Place gets plenty, and I'm certainly one of the major proponents of it. Um, but it's certainly part of that history. Yeah. Yeah, you know, a question just came up about what about Republic and Allied Bank buildings? Uh, there's a question about when they were built. Somebody here may have those dates. Uh, they they obviously um, followed Pennzoil uh, by, by a few years, right? Yeah, 1980s. Yeah. 80s. I think they're both interesting to, uh, especially Republic Bank, to compare uh, stylistically how, how quickly things could change. Uh, to see those two side by side, and what other comments uh, you might have about those downtown buildings, Michael? Mm -hmm. or yeah, Re else? Republic Bank, I think, is eighty three. Yeah, eighty three, and I think that eighty four is the other date that's given. And it's you know, there's, I mean, I I teach classes, you know, at uh, University of Houston that are dedicated toward to look just looking at Pennzoil Place and Republic Bank, you know, built by the same firm, you know, within a decade as a register for all sorts of changes that were taking place in architectural discourse, in uh, the form and aesthetics of buildings, in the shift from what was referred to stylistically often as late modern or late modernism into you know, what comes to be referred to as postmodernism. There's a whole shift in technical systems that allow that for from uh, glass and steel to stone cladding systems, for example. You know, there's all sorts of stuff going on um, that you can narrate just out of the relationship between those two buildings. So it's, you know, I, I find it amazing that Houston has, it's like a Petri dish, you know, especially the downtown of all of these different things going on, just, you know, chock-a-block next door to one another, uh, on, at least on that side of the city. And then you get to sort of, you know, the Houston center side where it feels like, you know, nowadays to Houston center is, is kind of buried within the way that that area did develop, right? It's now, there are lots of towers right. around, many of them from that time period, you know, some of them quite interesting, I think. Um, right. But it's sort of harder to kind of figure in your mind's eye a kind of alternate reality of something that is not fully there. Yeah, yeah. If you hadn't um, pointed out those, those um, vestiges of the original scheme, I don't think anybody uh, walking by would necessarily have been able to pick up on them. Uh, that's very instructive. Um, and then, uh, Carrie, a question about Tranquility Park uh, and its its uh, original design intents. I think we've talked about this one before. The uh, idea that it was a place uh, to serve uh, as as a place for protests or for public gatherings, maybe to keep people off the streets at a time when people were in the streets. No, actually, one of the, the the anecdotal. I think it's an. I know of it as anecdotal, I don't know if it's true, but it's, it's in reverse that part of the description of the park was not to encourage large gatherings. It was designed after the turmoil of students 
um, radical students in the late 60s, gathering on campuses, meeting around. Um, so that led to the really the sort of fragmentation between paving and the long, long water, long fountain and pond, making it seemingly hard to really have a large gathering. And that's part of the reason why I showed that slide from 2018 um, to show that even with that, that didn't deter a way for it to be used in a way a public gathering place can be used. So it was actually, yeah, it was kind of considered one of the criteria to kind of break it up so you couldn't have a big crowd. But in actual fact, it lent itself to it, especially when the city didn't maintain, wasn't able to maintain the fountain and you could stand all over the fountain and gather even more people. Yeah. Without going into um, extreme detail about uh, preservation issues related to these projects, and we'll stay with Tranquility Park for a minute. We, we know that it's a major water feature over a parking garage and that that's been challenging for the city to maintain. Are there other things that you would call experimental or novel that uh, Tapley uh, worked with that have been maintenance challenges besides that big one, Carrie? Well, uh, I, I mean, part of it too was how to you Houston, we need shade. We need, if we have a large open space, we need good shade. So he figured out how to, where he could place trees. I, I talked to it about along the perimeter of the site, but if you go there now, you realize how much shade coverage there is. That's where the landscape architect of Tapley inter, interconnected with the architect tablet because he figured out where he could get substantial innovation, tap into where the garage would allow him to get more soil available for trees. So that was all in, that was all integrated in what he was trying having to do. Uh -huh. And it wasn't just on the perimeter, but that's the easiest one to explain. Yeah. Uh, a question from someone named Jim Gast. He's, he's wondering, uh, interested in hearing about the thoughts about differences, similarities or differences between Albany Mall and two Houston Center. You might have to start that one, uh, Liz, with your knowledge of the Albany Mall. Well, I mean, they look, I mean, they looked quite similar. Um, you know, the difference is Nelson Rockefeller had a lot of money um, and was able to, I mean, essentially just remake all of uh, New York State. Um, Nelson Rockefeller said that if he hadn't gone into the family business, that he would have been an architect. Um, oh, really? I've never heard that. <laughs> so he built, um, I mean, he just built so much um, in New York. So when I think about the mall, I also wrote my graduate thesis on the State University of New York, 64 campuses that were all designed by Nelson Rockefeller. I consider him a builder. Um, he was a politician, um, but he was a builder. I mean, he saw, he saw himself in that way. Um, and I don't know if I would be able to compare it to, to Houston Center other than, um, you know, just realization. Um, yeah. It definitely took out um, a very large neighborhood in downtown Albany. Um, it, it separated the waterfront. Um, I don't know um, exactly where the water is um, in Houston, but it, it, you know, it disconnected the port of Albany from downtown Albany. Um, there have been at least two documentaries in the last maybe six, seven years about um, the communities that were displaced, a lot of pushback 50 years later. Um, but, you know, in terms of Albany, no one's really suggesting that uh, the mall come down, but that we at least need to reflect on um, what was there um, so that we don't uh, replicate those mistakes again. Hmm. Interesting point about that. So is it protected? In any way? It's a good question. Um, well, if it was completed in 76, uh, That's so coming up for it, maybe. Yeah, a couple of years. Yeah. What about in uh, Houston, uh, panelists? Uh, uh, is there a 70s building that uh, 
cries out for now that it's uh, eligible for protected landmark? Or are there are people uh, have those in mind? I know it. Um, I would say uh, One Shell Square, One Shell Plaza is uh, now 50 years old. And that was a similar experimental um, poured form concrete building. So it grew up like an anthill. Mm -hmm. uh, Gibmore Owens and Merrill and had some uh, antecedent buildings in Dallas, the bank building there, and then New Orleans also. Right, right. And as for historic districts, now that Houston's got uh, almost two dozen uh, bona fide historic districts, it's, uh, I suppose it's time to think about the uh, areas from the 70s era that could, could uh, qualify for some middle. I have been to some of the um, early golf course communities out um, 290, and um, they are very intact and very 70s. You've got those angular roofs. Um, I've not been in any of the houses, but just driving around, just the landscape, the planning, the siding with the golf course, that was a real... Um, I'm sure it predated the 70s, but I know there was a lot of them built in the 70s. And then just those cathedral ceilings inside and the angled roofs. Um, I don't know if we've done a 70s neighborhood anywhere in the U.S. yet, but I'm sure they'll be coming up very quickly now that we're yeah. new, so it's 72. Um, partly, yeah. I, partly, I think it's the question of a neighborhood is probably difficult in the case of the 70s in, in cities like Houston, especially partly because um, a lot of that architecture in Houston is so associated with downtown office buildings. And it's sort of a different conversation to think of, an, you know, a downtown office district as a preservation district. Also because urban 70s urbanism was associated in a lot of places with kind of dispersed buildings in a more kind of extensive condition and not, you know, I'm trying to think of neighborhood groupings that are, you know, like an old uh, intact Victorian neighborhood or, you know, it's kind of architecturally a little bit more difficult, but I might nominate, you know, downtown between like Commerce Tower, Pennzoil Place, you know, down to Allen Center and then maybe, you know, over, so, I mean, you know, there, I, I might, if I, I might, you know, if somebody wanted to put me up to it, I, I could maybe try to take crack it and you know arguing for something like that as a district that has a lot of these buildings actually intact somewhat that would be interesting to see what that district would look like what those boundaries would be uh in terms of this era especially uh a question about prominent architects of the era houston-based architects from the 70s are there um there were a lot of corporate firms that uh, hit their stride in the 70s we, we could think about those, but uh, maybe individuals too. I mean, lot, there are right new house and Taylor, you know, that uh, Anne already talked about. There are lots of, uh, I mean, Lloyd Morgan Jones and its various iterations, mm -hmm. Morris Aubrey, uh, you know, there are uh, not just Houston firms that are associated with the individual buildings that you can pick out, like, you know, for Allen Center, I think of as kind of the Lloyd Morgan Jones, right. you know, most perfect, you know, version of that kind of a glass, mirror glass tower. Um, but also a lot of those firms were associated with architects from outside of Houston that were building significant landmarks in the city where they were the associate architects on a whole bunch of other projects. Um, you know, Howard Barnstone, lots of other, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a long, long, long list of them. Yeah. And I think part of, to Michael's point, part of Houston proving itself was um, commissioning architects from outside of Houston to say, we are an international city. We can compete on an international scale. And We've gone pretty far into the course. evening without mentioning Philip Johnson, yeah. yeah right, right, of course. <laughs> who uh, maybe everyone knows, uh, famously quoted uh, as saying Houston was his favorite city at some point uh, 
in, in, in that puzzle, the uh, interviewer, I think, and, and his explanation was that that's where he had done the most buildings at that point. So of course it was his favorite. And I would say some of his best work is in Houston. Mm -hmm. Agree. And Steve, I, I sort of, uh, in preparing for this, I was reflecting on the fact that when Docomomo and Houston Mod partnered on our symposium in 2014, um, it was, I mean, some of the best sessions, um, certainly the best coffee and food <laughs> uh, of our symposium, but I don't think we dwelled that much on the 1970s. Um, when we were there. I, uh, I think there was a, a walking tour downtown. I definitely participated in that, but um, I feel like there's just still so much more to explore. Do you think a lot of people just, just you know, a lot of people, it's not uh, an area, era of nostalgia, at least not for the uh, architecture yet, or are we just because we're on the cusp of it, or are we there? The 70 turned 50, something that everybody recognizes now. Well, Michael is the expert on the Ugly Valley. Have we have we started climbing up the um, uh, Friendship Shore? Yeah, I mean, I so in in other you know advocacy and preservation related work in in Boston and Pittsburgh, you know, that I've been involved with, we 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 built up this concept of uh, what Liz is referring to. We, we talk about the Ugly Valley, which is this kind of fallow period in the reception of buildings or how they're perceived, which is, you know, you can ballpark it at maybe 30 to 60, 50, 60 years after, you know, buildings are uh, built, you know, for an open when, you know, they're, they're kind of at the low point in terms of their reception. And they're very often, if they're going to be demolished or uh, neglected or sort of otherwise, uh, you know, altered drastically, it often happens in that period. And these are, you know, they're buildings that are, they're not new or recent enough anymore to be regarded as kind of new uh, and progressive, uh, nor are they old enough to be regarded by a lot of people as historic in the same sense as other kinds of buildings, right? And they're often at the low point in terms of, you know, the end of their first useful lifespan, they're in need of maintenance. They've often been actively neglected by their owners or their stewards uh, and are suffering from a lot of problems. And in the case of the 70s, that intersects in in a lot of ways with the you know techniques and the material the, the materiality of a lot of these buildings that does pose very specific um, challenges. And so I think there is a way that you know in the same way that you know brutalist building I mean, first mid-century modern came into the historical window for nostalgia and kind of retro appreciation and valuation. And then it shifted to, you know, the seventies and brutalism that sort of came back and got revived in terms of public, uh, you know, interest. I think you could very easily argue that the seventies is now shifting into, you know, right at the kind of 50 year mark into yeah. that historical window. Yeah. And then, you know, you, you know where we go from there into the 1980s. Uh, oh, we'll no, 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 not tonight. Not tonight. Yeah. <laughs> that'll, be, that'll, be an, that'll be another one. This, but right. like your comments is uh, uh, a good uh, segue to the question from Hannah Curry, who, who asks, is there a context available for evaluating 70s buildings uh, in our HP eligibility? There's so many 70s buildings yes. surviving, it seems harder to get cheapos to agree that they're significant. I think, I think that's something we're starting to face, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll start that. Um, I found the Docomomo website to be enormously helpful. Um, we used, uh, there's this great article by Flora Cho, who's one of the board members, um, on the 70s. Because, you know, we have a 70s building. You think, okay, here we are. Boom, it's the 70s. It should be page turn. Now it's 70s. And really what we found in Anico, it is this progression through and um, it isn't a dramatic. And so in her article, Flora talks about some of the context, what's going on. As uh, we mentioned here, energy crisis, civil unrest in the 60s, and how that translates, you know, the Cold War is hyping up, um, how that translates to architecture. And um, what are we seeing? It's this simplification and this 
distillation to these pure geometries. When yeah. Michael and Liz showed, showed the silvers, those don't look anything like Anico, but you had to have Anico to get to the silvers. Important. Yeah. Um, also, GSA wrote a very good book, um, Growth, Efficiency, and Modernism. It is, uh, it does touch on the 70s, but it's, it's very well written and it's a very good guide for evaluation for National Register eligibility. It does focus on iconic, so you kind of have to um, supplement it with other sources. And that's one thing we did sort of talk about, and I think... Um, like Michael said, we're, it's easy to look at the iconic, the big, the, the ones you cannot ignore, but what about the vernacular? And we'll be looking at that probably more critically in the next yeah. to come. I wanted to mention the, uh, the exhibit that you um, co-produced with Delaney Harris Finch in 2016. It's hard to believe it's been that long already. Um, it was called Uncommon Modern. It was up at uh, AIA Houston's office and then it's toured Texas. I think you said it's in the Rio Grande Valley now. And um, I, I always say it's still got legs. It was a very, um, very, very well received. It was an eye opener, I think, everywhere it's been. And, um, and, and it's about the vernacular and not uh, some, some of which is from the same time period, the 70s that we're talking about tonight, but but of different scale and of, of different types, not um, necessarily parks and uh, corporate headquarters, but um, just about everything else. Uh, the smaller scale projects that are the ones that I remember most um, in uh, shopping malls as an example. I mean, we toured, I think we had two tours related to the exhibit opening and uh, you know, we looked at things that aren't necessarily considered historic or even, you know, um, quotes around the phrase good architecture but they're they're everywhere and they're part of our lives and um that was an eye-opener for me that tour with you Anna that day yeah it's easy to ignore these buildings because in Houston they're everywhere and they're just part of our daily usually we're seeing them from the car as we whiz by on the freeways I All think right. part of it too is that because it's, we're talking about the 70s Houston was booming and large parts of the country we're not building. So we have, we may have more resources to examine and to work through what this is than other places, which is why I think Uncommon and Modern was, was a, a first step. But I, until listening tonight, I just hadn't quite focused, even though I was an architect through that era. But in the 70s, there was, it was Boomtown. So we built anything and everything. And other places didn't do it. And we stopped in the 80s. So when other places picked up in the 80s, we had a quiet period. So it'll be interesting to see what buildings uh, get talked about for the 70s and where they're located. My feeling is, is that we could have a fair amount from Houston. Yeah. You know, just to just to add into that, I mean, yeah, there are lots of there are, there are lots of people if you go out and interview anyone who was working as an architect, as an engineer in Houston in that period, I mean, you get people just are dying to tell you these stories of the things you could do that, you know, they've never been able to do in any other period and the, all the innovations and, you know, Joe Colasso who came up in, in, um, in you know, the history of the, the Anaco Tower, for example, you know, uh, has given numerous interviews where he talks about all of the structural innovations that, you know, for Houston was where it was at in the 70s for an engineer like Joe Colasso. I mean, it was, they, you know, buildings, all of these buildings, Pennzoil Place, Anico, you know, and a, a million other buildings were really pushing the, pushing the boundaries of what was possible. So you can, you can tell not just, you know, from, I don't know, lots of people who were moving to Houston. I mean, he, and, and it was like a thousand a day that we're moving to Houston in the 70s, but from especially architects and engineers that there's just a joy in their voices when they talk about what life was like in that period that I think kind of points to that. Yeah. And while we're singing his praises for people who don't know Joe Colasso, he, he uh, inspired and influenced a, a great many uh, young engineers here, both in his practice and as a professor for, for, uh, for a very long time. So, yeah, he's very much a part of, of all this, I think. And 
And Steve, if I could just piggyback on uh, Uncommon Modern, um, you know, why that was just such, uh, it was, you know, Dokumomo gave it uh, a Modernism in America Award because it's just such a great template um, for um, how just local communities can uh, build awareness, um, you know, which is, you know, more valuable than, you know, some expensive survey of getting people involved, doing crowdsourcing. Um, you know, I love Uncommon Modern where, you know, you just give a bunch of people a bunch of maps, go drive around, take pictures, don't worry, they don't need to be museum quality. And, um, you know, and then let's just, you know, look at them and evaluate them and, and put some structure and order to them. Um, yeah. And, it's, yeah. and it's similar to what Dokumomo is doing this year. So our theme this year is on shopping malls. Again, um, trying to bring awareness, you know, uh, the sh shopping malls, you know, definitely were being built in every neighborhood in the 70s and 80s. Um, and so this year we're doing our own crowdsourcing where you can go on our website and fill in a form um, and talk about your mall. Um, and hopefully by the time we get maybe midway through the year, we're gonna start publishing some of those. Uh, but you could certainly, you know, take the example of Uncommon Modern um, and use it towards, you know, 70s, 80s shopping malls. I know we're not talking about 80s quite yet, but it's just a good example. And it's something that I was talking about earlier tonight before we started, which is, you know, that Dokomomo and Preservation Preservation Houston, as much as we want to, and, and uh, Houston Mod, we want to be everywhere. We really can't. And why it's so important for, you know, people who are watching this, just anyone who's, you know, loves buildings and, you know, wants to understand them better to empower all of you um, to help us um, in doing this work because they're, you know, aren't enough resources between our small organizations to, to do that work and why it's important to just get that word out and hopefully people will take part. Great, thank you, Liz. I think it's almost eight o'clock and maybe time to turn it over to Jim for final remarks. All right, well, thank you, Steve. And um, thanks to our speakers, Liz, Michael, Carrie, and Anna, and Steve, I've got to say, you're a moderator extraordinaire. I don't know if, I don't know if this is the job you wanted, but this is the job it turns out you were born to do. So it's fun tonight. Uh, yeah, it was a, it was a great discussion and some really good questions that came in and, um, you know, please feel free to contact any of us. If you, if there's anything that you think of later that, that you would like to talk more about, uh, we want to keep this conversation going because, um, we're just entering, you know, the official period of significance for the 70s, but there's a lot more to come. And I could hear the postmodern train in the background and the, I could hear the distant whistle of postmodernism. Yep. Liz is going to be driving that train. I know. I don't know. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I know that's a... AT&T was one and out. I'm done. Okay. That that's was it. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, you say that now. Let's see. There's, there is um, a couple more things to say before we, before we go. Uh, the other organizations um, who are represented here, Houston Mod and Dokomomo, uh, are great organizations that have fantastic programming of their own. So please do visit their websites, HoustonMod.org and Dokomomo-US.org to learn more about both if you're not familiar. Uh, and Preservation Houston, of course, has other programming on tap as well. One program that I'm really excited about given tonight's topic is uh, we're putting together a program that's going to take a look at the house of the century which is the one-of-a-kind home that was designed by the avant-garde uh art collective ant farm in 1972 outside of houston if you don't know the house of the century look it up you have never seen anything like it there isn't anything like it and it raises a lot of interesting preservation questions so uh we're going to have a discussion about um the story of the house, what condition it's in now, and what its future might be. That program is going to be coming up at the fall, so keep an eye out for it, and you can visit preservationhouston.org to read more about what else we're up to. Um, does anybody else have, have anything before we sign off? All right. Well, thanks again to, uh, to our speakers, and thanks to all of you for joining us tonight, and I hope that we will meet again soon, either online or in person, and everybody have a great evening. <laughs>